Olá, meu nome é Bruna Ventura e hoje eu tenho uma pergunta para você. Quando foi a última vez que você aprendeu algo novo? Aqui na Fundação Altino Ventura, a gente sempre escuta o Dr. Marcelo Ventura falando que um dia em que não houve aprendizado é um dia que foi desperdiçado. Pensando nisso e na otimização do seu tempo, estamos hoje estreando um novo formato do Web Update da Fundação Altino Ventura. Nesse primeiro episódio, contamos com a ilustre presença de Dr. Ike Ahmed. Ike é conhecido e é sinônimo de inovação e aprendizado. Ele passa o conhecimento de forma muito destrinchada e acessível a todos. Vocês vão ver que nessa aula ele vai falar sobre defeitos irianos e como conduzi-los. Ele vai falar sobre casos congênitos, pós-trauma, casos de iridodiálise, casos de coloboma. Realmente uma aula muito enriquecedora. É incrível como muitos desses casos a gente se depara com eles no consultório e muitas vezes pensa que não há muito o que fazer. E aí entra a Ike mostrando que sim. Há muito o que fazer por esses pacientes, corrigindo a, o defeito iriano que eles têm, melhorando a sua visão, melhorando a fotofobia, melhorando sua autoestima, o que tem um impacto enorme na qualidade de vida dos nossos pacientes. Gostaria, antes de passar para o Web Update, a, aproveitar essa oportunidade para agradecer ao nosso parceiro e patrocinador diamante, a Alcon. A Alcon é uma parceira da Fundação Altino Ventura e acredita, assim como a gente, na importância da, da passagem do conhecimento, no ensino do conhecimento novo e em fazer acessível o conhecimento a todos. Antes de passar o vídeo da Alcon, eu gostaria de lembrá-los que a Fundação Altino Ventura, um dos nossos pilares principais é o ensino da oftalmologia e fazer multiplicar esse ensino para poder ajudar cada vez mais pacientes. Então, sempre que você pensar em se, se capacitar mais, aprender mais, conte conosco, conte com a Fundação Altino Ventura. Hi, Ike. It's so wonderful to see you again. And Brazil is more brilliant and more warm now that we can be sharing with you in Canada this web update of the Altino Ventura Foundation. Thank you very much for participating. It's a great honor to all of us. It's true, Ike. Thank you so much for being with us today, sharing your knowledge. You're a Brazilian, almost a Brazilian citizen already. And it gives us a lot of honor to be introducing this new format of the Altino Ventura web update with your presence here. Thank you so much. Ike is from Toronto. You, everyone knows you. And we're truly grateful for your time today with us. And we're sure that we're going to learn a lot with everything that you're going to show us. So Ike, whenever you're ready, we're ready. Well, bon dia. Thank you so much, uh, Bruna. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ventura, for all, all the great work that you do. I mean, the Ventura family is a staple in Brazil, but also internationally with what you're doing, both in terms of your public work and your charitable work and innovation in, in the private world and everything else. So it's great to be here. And of course, you know, Brazil is very close to my heart. And Bruna, you and I have shared many stages together um, and That's usually true. on the same team, which is always good. <laughs> <laughs> winning, winning, right? Winning. Like winning. We like to, we like to win. Um, <laughs> yes. So it's really great to be here. And of course, I would be even better being in, being in person. And I already heard earlier, you didn't hear this, but Bruna already has already committed. I'm going to visit Recife soon. So she's already invited yes. me to her place. So yes, um, you're going to you're going to physically be, be introduced to the Altino Ventura Foundation soon, hopefully. I now that the that. pandemic is more more controlled. Hopefully, this is going to be in a very near future. For sure, we will. For sure, we will. And it's, uh, it's, it's really an honor. So thank you for having me here. Um, I think what I'll do, Bruna, if, you're, if it's okay with you, I have some, uh, some slides to present. I'm going to speak about uh, the repair of the iris and the pupil, um, often in conjunction with cataract surgery. Um, if you're okay with it, I have 30 minutes or so of slides, and then we can have a discussion, or I'm happy to 
have any questions in between, whatever you'd like to do. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. You can cut Let's me off anytime. That. Okay. So Sounds you know, good. these these are these are definitely some of our tougher cases, and you know, I know Bruno and I often talk about dealing with challenging cases. These so these cases really. Uh, provide some of the bigger challenges because not only are we dealing with the visual function of the patient, but also the functional repair of a patient's vision. And don't forget the cosmetic appearance of the eye. These are all very important parts of how we assess these patients. And I think often they're neglected because uh, there are secondary issues around the patient's vision. These are my disclosures and I just want to put them up here, of course, and I do work with many companies here and we've innovated and tried to develop better tools. I, I'm going to share with you, I believe, tools that any surgeon can use anywhere around the world that can have at her disposal to allow us to deal with these very difficult cases. One thing I like to always highlight is that unlike cataracts and unlike retinas and everything else, uh, our iris is something that's very visible to the world. Um, you know, they say the windows are the, are, are the, the eyes are the windows to the soul. You know, the pupils really are, the, are, are what really provides that beauty and provides that image as we look at the world and the world looks at us. And we start individualized by how our pupils behave, the color of, of our eyes and who we're looking at. And when we have damage to these structures, whether they're traumatic or congenital or surgical or otherwise, it really, really impacts the patients in many different ways. So remember the individualized nature of, uh, of what we do and how we repair these. Obviously, photophobia is a big concern for patients. It can be debilitating. Interestingly enough, some patients have very little photophobia with iris defects and others have a lot of photophobia. Sometimes it's hard to know. Uh, and I like to always be on the conservative side and try to repair in anticipation they may have a problem, particularly when we remove it with a cataract, because often the cataract can mask the uh, glare problems that the cataract is dense enough. The visual, of course, appearance of the eye. This patient here, very, very, uh, you, know, uh, you know, worried about the appearance of his eye. His self-esteem has been impacted. Um, this is one of the nurses that works in our city. You know, she, after trauma, she could not look at people in the eye. And this really made a difference with her social behavior and how she felt comfortable and how she interacted with the world and interacted with people. Um, this is an opportunity for us as ophthalmologists to really change not only patient's vision, but what we do, of course, best, which is to really improve the quality of life for our patients. Not, not every patient is concerned about how the eye looks, but when you really dig deeper, most patients do have some concern. If we can do something about it, it helps out. And although these are difficult cases to repair, you know, and this is a microscope view, but if you look at the patient you know, here after surgery, uh, we see a dramatic difference in how the patient looks. This is basically right after surgery. Um, and instantly, one day, this patient's life changed. We changed this patient's life. She, interestingly, wasn't even worried about uh, the vision. Uh, her bigger concern was how her eye looked. And again, I, I don't want to diminish the importance of visual uh, function, but let's not forget why we do what we do, is to really return the function to the patient as a whole. So our goal really is to try to restore that magnificence. We have eyes that are traumatized, and we can really repair the eyes to almost looking like a normal-looking eye if we do this right. It takes sort of the art and the science of what we do to do this perfectly well. The first principle when we manage these cases is determining whether there's enough iris there to repair. I always like to repair the iris, the native iris, if I can. This is something that most of us are, have access to do. If not, we need to think about an iris prosthesis, which is not always available and, of course, adds a lot of cost to patients. This is an example, though, where we could not repair the iris. There was insufficient iris that was remaining and this patient requires something more like a prosthesis to really repair the patient. Is the capsular bag intact? What's the lens status? And are we doing any combined procedures? Now, I'm not gonna speak about prosthesis, but I use these a lot. Now, these don't really improve the cosmetic appearance of the eye, but they can really improve the functional repair in terms of reduction of glare and photophobia. Addressing things at a very high level uh, at a very advanced level are these, are these uh, custom iris implants, which can be basically painted to the specification for what a patient needs to match their fellow eye. Or if we want to do aniridia cases, to basically choose whatever iris color the patient wants. They, they can pick an iris color. This patient wants to be like Brad Pitt, apparently. So he showed me a picture of Brad Pitt's eyes. So we, I think they're like that. 
So we basically sent it off and they customized it and here we go. Almost like Brad Pitt, right? Um, but you know what I mean? Basically, we can really make a difference for these patients. The other aspect of how do we address these uh, repairs is how do we tie the sutures in the eye? Passing the needle is one thing, but then how do we tie the knot? There are many different ways to look at, and these are different common ways that we have out there, mechanical, McAhmed, sliding knots, modified knots, intraocular knots. I will add in there also what has been popularized as the fourth or pupoplasty, which really is just the same as these sutures, but pacing additional throwdown without locking the suture. And now I like to lock the suture knot myself, but there are many who just put four throws and leave it at that. But any of these techniques, however, can be used with the four throw as well, if you choose to do that. I like to use hooks, Kuglin and Sinsky hooks, which allow us to uh, manipulate tissue and manipulate the iris and the suture. And don't forget the importance of microinstrumentation. This is where it is worth having the investment of having micro instruments and micro forceps that can allow us to manipulate the tissue, manipulate iris and do suturing. The difference between micro graspers, which are designed to grasp iris and grab tissue versus micro tying, which is basically to tie sutures in the eye or pass sutures in the eye or slide new sutures in the eye. And these micro tying forceps, for example, 23 gauge micro tying forceps are, re are really helpful to manipulate sutures in the eye. Let's, let's remember, of course, when we work in the eye, we have to really observe the laws of physics, understand the anatomical relationships with what we work in the eye, the decisions as a fulcrum, um, the machine and fluidics are all very important. Now, hand positioning and instrument grips is something that's very important. We often don't talk about this in terms of how do we hold instruments when we suture the iris. This is also important when we do FACO when we do corneal surgery or glaucoma surgery, how we hold instrumentation is really important. Um, and there are many ways to look at this. Uh, this is the example where we are holding instruments, for example, with a pencil grip in both eyes. The pencil grip is a very common grip that we use uh, in many different ways. They have advantages and disadvantages. The underhand grip may be helpful, for example, for certain approaches when maneuvering uh, from the side of the, of the globe. The dart thrower, for example, when we're coming across from a more anterior position, and the cigar grip is, is a very common position I like to use, which allows our hands to be very flat in the incision. Also, the overhand grip is very helpful uh, as well to keep our hands flat. And as you will see, and I have some videos on this, how we hold instruments. And here, for example, we have you know two different instruments, grips, a dart grip on the left side, and, uh, and, and an over overhand grip um, on, on the right hand here, uh, really allowing us to maneuver in the eye without, without moving the eye around and using the incisions as a fulcrum. And it's really uh, how we move our hands in the incisions, how we twirl in our hands, as you can see, twirling in our hands, maintaining our, our, our wrist positions and our elbow support and our arms in position while using the incisions as a fulcrum uh, very important in, in, how we, in how we do these. So this is what we don't see when we look at a microscope view that I show often and we show often. This is what's happening around the eye, though, that allows us to do it. Look, look at the changes in our hand position to allow us to do that. So don't forget the importance of that as we do that. Now, one of the most common techniques that I like to teach is what, what's been called, or what some people call the McAhmed approach, which is a modification of the mechanical approach. Here's how it goes. It's very simple. So just follow these diagrams here. Here we're passing a suture along an iris defect. In this case, we're taking three bites of the iris. You can take one bite, two bites, three bites of the iris, what you need to do. And then we're gonna basically uh, pull both ends of the suture through the common incision, typically temporal. Now we have both ends out of the eye. We get a micro tire and we loop around the long end and grab the short end. And then we push the short end into the eye. Uh, this is like if we were tying outside the eye. It's very similar to that. And then we can cinch the knot and we can then lock the knot as well. And here's just an example. We're passing the suture through the eye here. We're holding the, uh, the, um, the needle driver like a pencil grip. And then we're docking the needle uh, with the, with the uh, viscoelastic cannula after grasping the suture, the uh, iris with a micro forcep. And then we will, pat, we will pull both ends outside the eye like I showed earlier. Um, now we have both ends out of the eye. And we'll show more high mag videos shortly, but just to show what's happening with my fingers, look, my right hand has a micro tire, my left hand has a tying forcep. Uh, the left hand is holding the long end and we're looping around the micro tying forcep with the long end, like we were switching a corneal incision. And then we basically grasp 
uh, the uh, short end and pull and cross over the suture so the knot is flattened. Now look, I changed my hand position here uh, more to a, a, a flatter cigar grip or an overhand grip. And then we slide the knot into the eye. Notice the eye shouldn't move, the knot should stay in position nicely uh, and we have positioned it well. Um, we can also go to the full intraocular suturing technique, something I like to do. Uh, and this basically allows us to tie the suture in the eye uh, using both micro tires inside the anterior chamber. So let me just show uh, some sample videos of this. This is a patient who has Flomax. They had uh, difficult, complicated surgery done, and they have a large iris defect. This iris defect is under three clock hours. I feel I'm able to suture this in position nicely here. This is another topical anesthesia. I'm going to first grab the iris at the pupil margin to see how elastic it is. Fortunately, the iris is quite stretchable. We can take advantage of this to bring it together despite missing iris. Notice one thing here. I am making incisions here to allow me to pass, the, uh, pa pass the, uh, the needle all the way through the eye uh, using uh, the, uh, the, the, the long CIF4 needle. Um, and uh, I should have showed that earlier. I think I did show earlier the suture that we use, the 10 proline suture, which is what we use. Now, I make the sutures inc incision so we can pass it all the way along without torquing the eye, without torquing and damaging the iris, because we can get iris defects by this. Notice we're grasping the iris with a micro tire through my left hand, grabbing the other end of the iris, with, again, with the micro, micro uh, forceps, I should say. And I like to dock the needle when we come out. Why? So we don't uh, pass the needle through any corneal stroma, which can make it very difficult. Then the iris is trapped in the corneal stroma. So now we have made that complete pass. We can then now use the Coogan hook to bring the sutures, both of them, out of the main incision. This is exactly what we would do if this was a mechanical technique. Um, now we have both ends out of the main incision. We now loop around the long end of, with the micro time forcep, grab the short end. The short end should be only one corneal diameter, so it's not too long cross over to flatten the knot so it doesn't get uh, you know, uh, locked or, um, or caught. And now we push the suture into the eye to bring both of the iris pupil leafless together. It's helpful to go through another incision to grab the suture and pull with the micro time forcep. And now we bring the iris tissue together. We bring both, both sutures out of the eye again, grasp the short, and this is a locking knot now, locking throw. I like to lock the knots. Of course, a triple or four throw may be enough, but why not have the security of a lock knot? Uh, typically, a three one is enough. And now we cut the suture and we have a nice throw. Now, I'm going to continue to go back and forth, closing that defect. This one will likely require, I believe, about four passes to close the defect. Take our time. Notice I'm making the passes a bit wider. The bites are farther away from the pupil margin. And this allows the iris to bunch together, to imbricate in the closure. And this allows us to close some of those transillumination defects that are still present because the iris is, is fairly thin. And then we'll cut the suture knot with, the, with a pair of micro scissors. It's nice to have micro scissors so we don't have to you know, make a bigger incision or push, push a big scissor in there. And we'll do the same thing as we go back and forth, pulling the suture out of the eye and locking it. Now, the pupil itself is a very important part of the cosmetic result. This is important to get that pupil round and centered for the patient. This is what they most appreciate. I'm going to now, you see, cut the little bridge of iris that was there that was, that was traumatized. I'm going to show you now an intraocular tying where I pull both ends of the suture into the eye. One end is in the eye and the long end is partly out of the eye. And now we're going to twirl the instruments in our fingers around the, uh, around the actual long end of the suture, grabbing the short end and then cinching it together. This is really good control, although there's a learning curve for this. I know some may think it's a little bit difficult, but really this is like suturing outside the eye, but again, obeying the uh, closed system techniques using the, uh, the incisions as a fulcrum. It's so worth it to get a nice closure. I mean, look, at we're looking already better. This is a high mag. You, I'll show you the pictures when we, when we look at mag out a bit at, at, at more of a conversational distance. But you know, the, dif the difference here is, is quite palpable when we look at the difference of this. And when we compare the eyes, when you're looking at the patient from maybe three, four feet away, it's hard to tell the patient had an injury. It's really the value of, uh, of using the art of, 
of our eyes and our imagination and visualization to do this. And again, taking the time to do this slowly and methodically is important. We published a paper recently, it's in JCRS, I think just this, this last month in print, or sorry, online, I should say in press. This is using endodiathermy for iridoplasty. This is a 23 gauge endodiathermy. And this is a, this is a case I'm gonna highlight. This is a core topic pupil with missing iris. Not only do we have to close this iris, we have to recenter it. Like I said before, um, that is important from a cosmetic appearance and functional as well. One thing that's helpful here, I said temporally, I use my left or my right hand to do the work. You notice I have the left hand passing the needle where the right hand is grabbing the iris. And it's helpful to be able to use both hands. Practice using both hands. I will be an elitist and say that I think that uh, ophthalmic surgeons should be uh, not ambidextrous, but comfortable using both hands and practice it because it really makes a difference for access and allowing to make the least traumatic pass of needles, for example, or sutures. Here we basically are suturing in the eye again, like I showed earlier, grabbing the short end. We have the long end partly out of the eye. So we sometimes have to bring the tying force up out of the eye, which is okay to basically tighten the knot because we have we have small space in the anterior chamber. Cut the knot. Now watch, here's the endodiathermy. We are gonna now use linear uh, cautery, coagulation on our phaco machine, on the phaco foot pedal to move that iris. Look how much I can move that iris. This is very effective at mobilizing the iris and moving it. Uh, I'm not done doing that yet, but now I can pass another suture to close that defect. And again, tie, tie, tying the, uh, the knots, bring the iris closer together. Let's close that defect. I'll just forward it because you've seen it me do it many times. And by the way, don't be afraid to make more incisions to improve the access uh, of using instruments in the anterior chamber. Take the effort to close that iris. It's worth taking that extra suture. Why not, right? We could be tired and done, but taking an extra five minutes to close that iris, so worth it to really have a nice closure and that pupil is looking much better already. But it's not quite round. There's a bit of a straight edge. So I'm going to use the cautery again to do a little bit of mild cautery. Be careful not to do too much. The farther away from, we're from the margin, the less effect we have, which is good to control. And we can also increase the power as needed. Look at the difference here after surgery. I would say this is a reasonable result after surgery. The patient was, was I think, much happier with their result. And I like to see that. This is a fake patient with a traumatic injury to the uh, cornea, as well as the iris, the cornea healed. The patient's phacic. I just want to mention that I do many phacic eyes. I don't, I know this is a bit of a jump because of course the risk of cataract is there, which you warn patients about, but using viscoelastics and using really careful passes of the suture, using micro forceps to grab the iris, going in the eye. Here, we're going to tie the suture here in the anterior chamber, very controlled. And I'm just showing this position to show you that we can do this in a phacic eye as well. Close that defect and we have a nice closure. This patient was 20, 30 uncorrected. Uh, and so, you know, why not get this patient looking better and not take the lens? This patient is still, this was done about 10 years ago, actually. Patient still has a clear lens. Although again, there's a risk the patient may develop a cataract and they're fine with that. They want to get this closed. And here's the patient after surgery. Uh, and we can, we can certainly um, get a nice uh, cosmetic closure effect. Now, this patient here has an atonic dilated pupil. Here we can basically, uh, we need to close the iris and the pupil in a more circumferential manner using a circlage technique. Here we're using two, uh, two ends of a double-armed CIF4 needle. Um, this is effective at, again, passing uh, sutures from the cornea down through the iris. Um, and uh, this allows the, uh, the, uh, the needle, as you can see here, to be placed where the iris is in a running uh, under-over pass. So we're going through the iris from the front, coming from behind and going back up again. This is a rolling suture here. And by doing this in, in four different throws in four different quadrants, um, this allows us uh, to you know, close this uh, iris in a per string nature. This is called pupil cerclage. It's one of my favorite things to do. Take multiple bites. This will allow for a nice round pupil and do this in four different passes using the paracentesis to come out of the eye and back into the eye. Um, and this now allows us to get a nice circumferential suture. We can now throw outside the eye, pass it in the eye. This is the McAmmon approach again. And it's so helpful to control the size here by, by tightening the suture in the eye with the micro tire. I like to do this, by the way, this patient had a multifocal lens, which I know is a bit of a stretch, but very keen on having spectacle freedom. 
Um, and uh, we, of course, want to make sure this patient is going to be happy. We don't have to take the lens out. Fortunately, we got lucky here. And now I'm happy with about a three and a half millimeter pupil. That's about the size we typically go for. This allows for an adequate entrance size and allows for adequate uh, posterior segment visualization. I know many ret retina folks will say, what about the retina? But we can adequately visualize the retina with spell depression and indirect viewing. And if we have to, we can cut the suture if we have to. Of course, a bad diabetic patient, I wouldn't make the pupil this small. I'd probably go to about four millimeters. But to get the right cosmetic result, as you can see, this is right eye after surgery and left eye. Patients wearing a multifocal contact, we can get a very good result. Let me just show one more case. This is a more difficult case because they have patient has an iris uh, iridodialysis about six clock hours and also an atonic pupil. Um, and we have to manage the cataract as well. This patient, uh, you know, had trauma about a few months ago. We want to get in there before the iris really fibrosis too much. There's some posterior synechia present. I'm taking down the conjunctiva to uh, plan on the aerodialysis repair. We're going to place uh, multiple iris hooks in. I first need to release the uh, synechia from, uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from the lens capsule here. And of course, viscoelastic is very helpful to maintain the chamber. There's some release of the, uh, of the iris. The iris may be rolled or synech to itself as well. So it's helpful to unravel it if necessary. This, these are the iris hooks we're placing here because we're going to first pay attention to the actual lens and, uh, and get the cataract out first. We're going to vacuum some of that pigment off, use some tripan blue over the anterior capsule. We're going to paint it. I don't like to inject it directly because we don't want the uh, tripan blue to go posteriorly or go places we don't want to go. And this is more controlled under viscoelastic. We can now uh, do a capsular exit. We can remove the lens, which is pretty soft, put a CTR, put an IOL in. And we can then now pay attention to the iris. Now, the iris, I want to basically unravel a bit. I want to flatten it out uh, to basically, um, you know, maximize the area. Um, the tissue is not, is still pretty, pretty relevant here. And notice I'm making a scleral groove here. This is the limbus here. This is the end of the blue zone. And going about, you know, three quarters of a millimeter, millimeter behind the blue zone is typically what we do. Maybe 1.5 back from the, from the limbus. This will approximate the iris root. We're going to reattach the iris to the iris root. And we're going to just eyeball and pull, pull the iris with micro forceps to visualize where we want it. Now I'm using a straight needle, an STC6 10O proline suture. And we're going to take multiple mattress sutures here. We're going to go centrally here. There's one pass. The distance between my passes will vary. Um, and this basically will allow us to make uh, an arc pass, which is going to be longer as we go out of the eye. The circumference of the sclera, of course, is greater than the circumference of the iris root. So when you come out of the eye, come out farther apart to allow the iris to fan out, to stretch out, of course, uh, over that circumference, meaning the distance between the passes is shorter here than shorter here. Uh, I like to dock the needle with a 27 gauge needle in this case. And I like the control of using multiple mattress sutures. One mattress suture can usually close about a clock hour and a half, up to two clock hours even. But I'm going to use multiple mattress sutures. I, I like to do this because I can titrate the tension of each suture as necessary. I am not locking the suture. We're going to slip the knot here, uh, and we're going to you know, adjust it afterwards. I'm going to now visualize where do I want that iris to be repositioned back. We're going to pass the needle through the iris root. And again, come out through the uh, sclera. There's one pass. Uh, there's a second pass as we come out. And again, do a nice slip knot here to bring the iris together. Notice the pupil is a bit peaked, so loosen it. We don't need to get the iris right at the angle. We can hang it back a little bit if needed so we don't peak the pupil. Again, I like to, again, use a micro forcep to grab the iris. We're going to now make our third mattress suture. There's one pass, second pass. And now you can see we have uh, now closed this iris defect. But we also have the pupil that atonic. We're going to release any sinica in the angle, stretch the iris. And even after years later, in this case, uh, we're able to manage this. Although I like to get these irises earlier than that. The uh, uh, cerclage technique here, uh, we're going to again use the same approach as I showed earlier. Again, be helpful to use both hands in, in a somewhat ambidextrous way. Um, and this allows the uh, needle to be passed. Notice what is doing the work here. The, the iris forcep is doing the work and the needle is being held in the anterior chamber, just placing it where it needs to go because this is more controlled than having to move up and down with the needle, in my experience. Take multiple bites, probably about six bites per quadrant. 
And then we're going to come out to the uh, paracentesis incision here as we pass the needle through. Follow the curve. Be careful not to pull too hard. This part's a bit more challenging because now we're going into the area where the aerodidalysis was. Don't pull too hard. And very importantly, control that needle. A lot of beginning surgeons have trouble controlling the needle as it's passing through the eye. So get a good grip of it. Um, I'm using a bit of the, uh, of the um, shaft of the uh, needle driver to do that. Uh, using my right and left hand as needed. Um, there's two passes across the, across the angle, the pupil margin, I should say. Now we're going to, again, use a McAhmed loop around the long end, pass it in, and push it into the eye. Now, I'm not going to lock the suture. I have to adjust the tension between the pupil and the aerodialysis here, um, and this will allow me to get the right balance here. Notice that the, the pupil pulled down a bit. I'm going to pull it up a bit with my suture. I feel I'm happy with that. Okay, we can now lock that suture in place where the pupil is well-centered, uh, and then we can cut that knot. Now we can go attention to the aerodialysis part. And here we can basically, uh, again, tighten or loosen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lock those sutures in place and bury those knots in place here. Um, this is very gratifying to repair the significant uh, trauma for this patient. We're just really using our, our raw hands. We're using suture that's available, tenoproline suture on a curved or straight needle. We're using micro instruments, which I will say is a specialized instrument that is helpful to have. Um, and uh, really uh, needles that help us and hooks to help us. So this is something that I feel that can be done really, really around the world. Um, this is just a patient one day after surgery already looking better. We, we can change the lives of patients. And I think this is one of the benefits of that. Um, I know I went through a lot of different techniques. I just want to put a little plug for our book we recently published. Um, when I come to Brazil, I'll bring some copies um, uh, for, for you as well, Bruna. And uh, these techniques, we just talk about how to do things, just really step-by-step. Step. We've written it in a little bit of a comic book approach, kind of to show pictures and to show, um, you know, uh, the different uh, approaches. And of course, always, always happy to share things on social media. Um, it's been wonderful, not, well, not wonderful, pandemic's not wonderful, but wonderful to be able to share lots of different um, techniques and pearls and just more share ourselves together. I, I'm very grateful for Bruna. You were part of some early webinars we did um, back um, in the day. Remember those webinars, the Guardians of the Lens? Uh, 5,000 people yes, attending. Yes, 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 that was amazing. We'll never forget those times together. So uh, I hope I didn't speak too long and I hope that I was able to share some techniques of iris repair, a very favorite part of what I do in my, my career and happy to talk more about this. So again, thank you so much uh, for, for really inviting me here. Uh, in this in this special forum, Ike, I think you you mentioned the Guardians of the Lens webinar, and it was one of the first I think we did during the pandemic, and that was very very important. I'm sure not only for me but for all the colleagues that were watching and that were participating, because it gave us we were there. There was so much doubt at that moment, and we were all so afraid of everything, and that made us go back as if we were all in a meeting, mm -hmm. seeing friends and getting together and discussing cases. So I'm sure that was like a hug for all of us. And that, that was the feedback, right? At that time from all, the, all of us that participated. So thank you again for putting that together. That was amazing. And to think that 5,000 people were watching like from their home or wherever they were, they were, that was like unbelievable. It would be unimaginable before the pandemic. So that was something that that at least one thing positive that the pandemic brought us. For example, for you to be here today in Recife, <laughs> <laughs> participating long distance. And that that's something for sure that the pandemic brought us that we wouldn't have before uh, such in real life. The cases that you showed, as always, amazing. I wrote down some topics for us to discuss. Um, one of the things were that you mentioned how much these cases as surgeons, we can positively impact our patients. I'm sure all of them were extremely grateful for you to you. And it's something that we as ophthalmologists and cataract specialists, we have to always remember it's not only the vision, but the, the cosmetic 
colleagues and and the day to day that that nurse that you showed i'm sure she's one she was one person before and one person after your surgery and the impact that you had in her life is unmeasurable so um i congratulate you wonderful wonderful cases and wonderful teaching cases starting my questions with regards to the endothermy how do you so it's our regular phaco machine you just change the tip right that you're going to use um, how much energy do you start the case? Yeah, you know, this is something that kind of came to me kind of fortuitously. I had a patient that uh, had some bleeding. And by the way, people often ask, Ike, what about bleeding? You must get lots of bleeding. And, and it's actually surprising that we rarely get bleeding. Sometimes if we pull the iris root too hard, it can happen. But that can be tamponaded with viscoelastic. Um, and it's rare to have a problem. Uh, we, of course, need to treat the steroids after and the pressures may be high for a short time with pigment dispersion. We can usually mm -hmm. ride that out. So anyways, I had a case where there was a little bit of iris bleeding and I used this endodiathermy uh, actually for my, for my glaucoma surgery on sclera. Um, and this is basically a 23 gauge uh, endodiathermy with a little blunt end. Uh, and it's a bipolar uh, device. Plug it into our, our phaco machine. I have this Centurion. Plug it in like we normally would. And I use a power of zero to 40%. You don't need a lot, just 10%, just go linear control on that so we can control how much energy you put in there. And it's amazing what we can do to really, you know, move the iris and stress the iris. And those are permanent. Uh, and we, we just published, actually, I don't have the reference here, but if you look at JCRS, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, one of, one of my recent Brazilian fellows, Tissi De Francesco, was the primary author on that. And it's really amazing how much we can move the iris around. And, you know, be careful, though. If you do too much, then it's harder to reverse it because the iris is now, is now pulled over. So start farther away from the pupil margin, use low energy. Just touch the iris briefly. And when you come off, just make sure you're not stuck on it so you don't pull too hard. And, and it works quite, it works beautifully. I'm really amazed at how much we can do. Without that, it's hard sometimes to get that round pupil just perfect. Wonderful. No, amazing, amazing um, idea. And I'm sure it's going to be very helpful in many cases. I already wrote down your tips. <laughs> With regards to, you talked about how to uh, managing, let's say, uh, intraocular pressure and inflammation. Which drops do you do you use in these patients? How do you manage postoperatively? Yeah, great question. You know, I, I'll say one thing. And at the end of my suturing, I do all this work. I don't go back with my irrigation aspiration handpiece or my retractor to remove viscoelastic. You know, it, sometimes what can happen is the pressurization of the anterior chamber can cause the sutures to buttonhole or the, not, or the sutures to tear the iris even. And some of these mm -hmm. irises are very delicate. So in fact, I actually remove the viscoelastic manually. Now, what that means is that patients often do get high pressures in the first few hours after surgery. So we often follow them back in the same day, maybe three, four hours later. I put them on oral dimox you know, 250 milligrams, you know, three, four times a day for the first two days. We go heavy on the steroids. There's a lot of, a lot of pigment that's dispersed and some inflammation. So there are Q2 hours for the pred for for the first week or so. And I add alpha agonist, beta blockers, whatever I need to, to control that pressure. Now, if the patient doesn't have glaucoma, it's really short lived. And uh, by the first couple sure. of days, you know, things are back, you know, to normal. And the glaucoma patient, I'm always careful. Sometimes we combine them with, uh, glaucoma procedures or really have to go more aggressive with our medication. But whatever it is, it's usually short term and we can mm -hmm. usually manage it by following the patient closely and using the right medications to control the pressure and inflammation. Wonderful. So steroids um, drops, you don't use, let's say, trimcinolone or, or dex subconjunctival dexamethasone intraoperatively? You know, I think the cases. dex is a good idea. I mean, it's short acting and it kind of stays there as a deep. I think it's a really good idea. I don't typically do that. I like to titrate the steroids. But okay. if the patient's not going to be compliant or I'm worried about it, I'll readily give them an injection in the office to do that. You know, Kenalog okay. sometimes, I mean, again, I'm a bit biased because I have glaucoma patients. I worry sometimes about a longer term steroid response, but, you know, I think a little bit is fine. And if, of course, if we're using retractomy, sometimes these patients have retractomy requirements and everything else. Usually they have a bit of triumph in the, in the, in the eye to stay in the vitreous anyways. So, but uh, generally speaking, I have to say the inflammation is not usually a problem. I like using non steroidals for a good three months to prevent CME. These patients are at risk because they have had complex histories as well. Wonderful. Yeah. Great, great tips and comments. I, you, you spoke on leaving, let's say, a pupil of three and a half millimeters of diameter in general. Do you use like a caliper to, to titrate that or a special device? 
I, I, I used to do that. And I think that's reasonable to do. There are intraocular rulers that can be used um, and other measuring devices. Of course, you can also use a, a, a modified ring on the cornea. Remember, of course, to take into account for corneal magnification, of course, if you do that. Um, but you know, that's generally the rule I use. Um, I really haven't had a problem as far as being able to have the retina visualized. Of course, there are some who make a very small pupil for refractive reasons, you know, uh, to, mm -hmm. uh, to reduce, uh, you know, coronal HOAs and things. And that's obviously more difficult, but once you're at three and a half, three millimeters, uh, that's reasonable. There are some patients, as we know, who don't dilate beyond three and a half millimeters. So that's usually generally enough. And if, I think when you're learning and starting, it's useful to have a measuring device, uh, as you have on the eye, I think that's useful to do. And remember the magnification issues. So whatever you measure outside the eye is actually bigger than what's in the eye. Wonderful. And changing a little bit on cases, you showed the iridal dia the last case, the iridal dialysis case. You do actually a groove to bury the knot, but you it's not like you don't do Hoffman pockets for that, or you prefer doing the groove, right? Like we do the groove. Um, <laughs> also groove. Yeah, you know, I, I've gone through different iterations. I used to make flaps, we tried Hoffman pockets. I have, I have to say that um, I just find this to be simple to do. I make a groove that the suture will be buried into the actual sclera. It helps mm -hmm. to have that docking. I use a 27 gauge needle to dock that suture in that case. Um, and therefore it makes a little larger opening so I can rotate the knot into the eye. It's very important not to have the knot on the surface of the sclera. And the groove just allows the suture itself to kind of sit in the groove. You know, hop and pockets I think are, are not unreasonable either. I find that Visualization sometimes is a challenge, bleeding sometimes is a challenge, and it's so important to get the exact perfect tension. And it's sometimes a bit challenged with the pocket. So I moved more, more away from that and moving more to bare sclera, open the conge, I can tighten the tension. The same thing I do, for example, for suturing lenses or for suturing uh, capture tension devices, I find the control is exquisite and it allows me to really titrate the tension adequately, which tension is so important with all these procedures as far as not too much, not, not, not too little, just right. Yeah, I thought that the case that you showed that you have so, ma so ma many clock hours of iris unattached, the groove made a lot of sense because you, it, it was very easy um, to do. If you had like a Hoffman pocket, it would be a very big and, true, yeah. and extends, right? Um, Hoffman true, pocket. Um, for the last case that I wanted to, to imagine here, you didn't show a case of coloboma, iris coloboma, um, and suturing or repairing an iris coloboma. So I just wanted to touch base a little bit on, on that topic. So if you had, let's say, a iris coloboma of around two clock hours, how would you manage this patient? Yeah, great question. And uh, yeah, we have had many coloboma cases, even fake patients, like, you know, 20-year-olds who want to get the coloboma fixed, which is another story. So a couple of things with those patients. First of all, the case I showed with the corectopic pupil, that was more of an extreme coloboma. I would manage it very similarly. So basically the use of iris cautery, endodiathermy, very helpful to move the iris. The goals are twofold. One, close the defect and two, recenter the pupil. It does help to make a small sphincterotomy. And Bob Sioni published this a few years ago. A little sphincterotomy, maybe about uh, two millimeters from the iris uh, angle insertion. And that allows the iris to stretch a bit, the pupil to stretch a bit, and then closing multiple bites to close the, uh, the coloboma. And then as needed, using a small a cautery to move the pupil up a bit. Because if we only close the coloboma and that's all we do, the pupil will still be decentered. So, um, and two clock hour, colobomas are actually one of the more easier ones to close because there's enough tissue to move. The harder challenge is to get a well-centered pupil. So that's why using a combination of a small sphincterotomy at either either side of the, of the coloboma on either side, snip, snip, very small. The, 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 the iris, the pupil will then stretch a bit, probably at least three bites of sutures to close that coloboma and then cautery to move the pupil up a bit and keep it centered and round. That's the combination of things we do. I should probably edit a video and post it uh, now that you asked that question, but those, those can be quite <laughs> rewarding to do it that way. Wonderful, wonderful. I'll, I'll look forward for that video because these are very, very challenging and interesting cases at the same time. Ike, moving to the end of, of our web update, we are a teaching institution, the Altino Ventura Foundation. So I wanted to hear a little bit from you. What do you think is now, how, how the teaching of FACO and these challenging cases have been, um, have changed over the last months or, or few years? 
and how do you th see it in the near future? Yeah, I mean, and again, I just want, I want to congratulate you for that work that you do. I mean, it's such an important uh, work and it, and it also allows us to really extend our limits and our skills for vulnerable patients who need that and extend it beyond that as well. So a couple of things, I mean, and we learned this in the pandemic as well that, you know, um, our trainees, for example, who were operating, you know, the use of model eyes has become now, you know, commonplace. Um, whatever model eye you use, synthetic eyes, which are used for simulation, um, can actually do a really good job to help surgeons to basically understand where to make incisions, how to hold the hands, how to hold the instruments, you know, where to place uh, the forceps. They don't act like human tissue, of course, uh, but they really allow simulation to do it in a way so that when you're in a human eye, you can really have that muscle memory about what to do. So we, I find that to be a very helpful medium to use. Of course, there are other simulators simula simula out there that can be done as well, which are more high tech. But that's an area that we've really done a lot of work in to really take it to the next level. Um, and those, mod those modules now available from many different companies, I think have been very, very helpful. You know, foundations from the work that you do, I think we all know, it, a lot of this is of course, getting access for patients, but more importantly, it's about training. It's about education. It's about, you know, using the web as you're doing here to give people the stimulus, the impetus to go to the next step. Videos, of course, are an amazing resource to, to learn that. And it's the mindset that is first needed. So first is the mindset. The cognitive side of things is really key. And that is, again, going through puzzle solving, is going through the simulation exercises, going through imagination, to work through those problems in your head and work through them with your hands and modelize. And using you know, the power of teachers um, is, is so vital. And I think you know, now we're moving to the next phase where we're using, for example, real-time uh, supervision, you know, using... Uh, streaming online over Zoom, where you may be operating in, in a city in Brazil, and I'm sitting here, I'm watching everything. You're on your iPhone, connected to with a beam splitter, like MicroRec, for example, and I'm basically, you know, guiding you to what you're doing as a teacher, and you're giving me feedback. I mean, that can be now virtual, live, you know, supervision and proctoring, uh, without having me to be there. Although I'd rather be there, to be honest with you, um, but that allows <laughs> us to do that, you know. And I think that's an amazing, amazing resource to just democratize teaching. Wherever you are, you don't have to travel. You're in your own OR with a simple beam splitter and a 3D printed universal adapter to your iPhone and an internet connection over Zoom and, and a 4K iPhone that we all have mm. that we can basically stream from in great quality. It's, it's incredible mm. the, how the world's come together uh, you know, with these technologies. It allows us to leverage that. I think those are, those are some of the key points. And of course, I'm speaking more as a surgical teacher, but of course, the medical knowledge is key to to, to build first. Yeah, it's amazing that you mentioned um, the teaching and, and someone watching you operate from wherever they are. We are currently having a, a, an attendee that's living in the US and another one that's living in Sao Paulo. And they every week connect the, at distance to guide our residents and our fellows from the different specialties that they are. And the micro rec came facilitating that with the surgery. For sure, that's going to be very useful. Um, I wanted to invite everyone to buy your book. I'm sure it's wonderful. I've seen some of the pages and it's just as everything that you do, Ike, it's very um, education oriented. And you, as here in the webinar, give the tips and the small details that make all the difference in the cases. And for that, I thank you. And, and I'm sure we, you have seeds planted all over the world with the knowledge that you, that you share. I wanted to thank for your you for your time here today with us. And I wanted to invite Dr. Marcelo Ventura. I'm seeing that he, he's connected for oh. his final words um, before we say goodbye. Thank you so much again, Ike. It's such a pleasure to see you again, even if it's on screen. Well, Bruno, I want to I just thank you. I mean, you're such a, uh, a star in our world. And I, I wouldn't say rising because you already have risen and you've shared <laughs> so much. You're a breath of fresh air. You add so much enthusiasm and novelty to uh, our, our work. And uh, it's a thrill to, to be here with you. And I, and I thank you again as your kind words at the beginning of the pandemic. It was you as a select group of people that we came together. And the warmth that we had was absolutely amazing during that vulnerable time. So I'm feeling the same warmth here, although in Toronto, it's a little bit colder than it is in Recife, I'm sure. <laughs> So uh, keep yes. on spreading your great wealth uh, of knowledge, Bruna. I'm so proud of everything you do. And 
uh, I, I just I, I just have the greatest uh, a feeling when you speak and you share your words and you you add your own thinking. Um, and you know you should you deserve all the credit and and the sharing of knowledge uh, of what you're doing. And, and to the Ventura family, uh, you know you guys have just been incredible as far as a role model for all of us to to teach and learn and to do with such great uh, you know kindness and smiles and, and happiness. So thank you. Thank you. Uh Hi, I Hi, Ike. This is Marcelo Ventura. Hey, Marcelo. Uh, how are you doing? How are you doing? So nice to see you. I'm in, uh, I'm in Natal at the National Congress of Ophthalmology. That's why we're not so close, even close to, to, to Bruna. But let me tell you, as always, great presentation, nice thoughts, great ideas. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And we have new, uh, new time coming to the foundation. Uh, we are just uh, uh, have our inauguration of our headquarter. It's an amazing building. Uh, and maybe uh, someday you can come anytime you are very welcome. And certainly will be a great idea if we keep, uh, uh, keep together uh, in, in lifetime, I, I really understand that you are a busy guy, but we do realize that you are uh, a great difference uh, when we talk about uh, teaching. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, seeing you. And, and anytime here or in Canada or, or any place in the world, once we are able to go, we'll be great time to say hello. Thank you so much, Marcel. And, and again, uh, you, you've been an inspiration as well. And, and, and thank you for your kind words. And, and yes, we will absolutely have to uh, get together. Um, you know, you know, you know, Brazil is close to my heart, man. It's uh, something special <laughs> when I visit your country and the warmth that uh, I feel and, you know, the, the beautiful, uh, you know, knowledge sharing. It, it's such a great camaraderie appear, you know, environment. So I love it. And I look, look forward to, uh, seeing what you do um, in, in your own city and, and the great work you're doing. So thank you so much. And thank you for having me here today. Wonderful. Okay. And finally, and finally, I would like just to, to, to congratulate uh, our team. They have worked a lot and a uh, new generation. And I'm very proud to have this team along with us because they are changing the way we do things. So, uh, uh, my best regards to everyone involved in the project, uh, and thank you all again. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ike, and thank you, Dr. Marcelo and Dr. Liana, for, for coming in the session and sharing it with us. Have a wonderful day, Ike. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Ike. Le Liana, Take thanks, care. So much as well. thanks so much again for the introduction. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay.